I could go ahead and start if you want. Um, sure. With, you know, sort of my background and how I got into nonprofit accounting. Introduce myself. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Fran Leahy and I, oh, here's Sarah. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, I am located right now in Nashville, Tennessee, but I also have a residence in Black Mountain, North Carolina. And so through most of this, I've been there. I've been here about four weeks since March 15th. So we've been able to work remotely. It's been very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I got my undergraduate. I'm originally from South Carolina. I'm an undergraduate at Wofford College and I started working in public accounting. <clears throat> and then um, I went to Appalachian to get my master's. <laughs> so at that point, you didn't have to have 150, but I, I wanted to go ahead and get my master's. There's a lot of times there is a, a glass ceiling and people want an extra degree, mm -hmm. <clears throat> the extra hours. And then I taught at Appalachian for a few years. This was a long time ago. <laughs> and um, I was a, an adjunct professor there teaching principles one and two and working in the accounting department. So most of the people that I taught with have since gone, but um, there's a few. Claudia Kelly is, is one of them that I know. Um, <clears throat> They'll be joining us a little later. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I moved to Nashville, Tennessee and I uh, taught at Belmont College here uh, one semester and then um, started with internal audit at HCA, which is Healthcare Corporation of America, and did that for a few years, five years or so, and traveled all over the U.S. with that in internal audit. And then I started in public accounting in 2003 because I wanted the flexibility and to stay at home more because I had a young family, and I've been with public accounting ever since. I'm at my current firm, which is Craft CPAs in Nashville, Tennessee. We are a mid-size, I would say, regional firm. And um, I have been here 12, almost 12 years. And I have been in tax. I started in just tax, worked in small business tax. And then about 60 years ago, we sort of morphed into some niche, niches. And so I had the most experience with nonprofit tax. And so I actually became in just that niche. And so that's all I do is nonprofit tax. So it's been very good to, instead of having to know a little bit about all of the tax returns, 1120s, 1065s, 1040s, I just do 990s <laughs> so, and 990ts. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> the reason we did that was that we had a separate, as most accounting firm, public accounting firms do, we had a separate tax department from our audit department. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our clients, we would get client surveys back. And the clients were um, not happy, I guess I should say not satisfied with the fact that the audit group would come out, they would get to know the business, they would get to know the nonprofit, and then it would be turned over for the tax return to a whole set of new people and they wouldn't know as much. And the nonprofit tax return, if you haven't looked at one, it is a compliance return. If you've had any tax at all, it is, you know, you're looking at trying to minimize the tax that you pay to the Internal Revenue Service. <clears throat> That's not it for a nonprofit. A nonprofit is compliance. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing what you said you're doing? Are you in compliance with the laws for the nonprofit? And so it really does fit more with the audit. And so we moved our tax department for nonprofits out of the tax department. And I am actually sitting in the audit department and the audit department, the audit personnel actually prepare the tax returns and I oversee that practice. Uh, that's sort of, it's, it, I went around the world to get to where I am now, but, uh, but I really like it. It's, it's very interesting. I like working with nonprofits and seeing the good that they do in the world. Well, that's interesting because so often <laughs> accounting students are sort of torn between, do I want to go with tax or do I want to go with audit? <laughs> and it seems like if you're going to work with nonprofits, they're one in the same. Exactly. We, we do get a lot of, um, <clears throat> I mean, we get new hires. Like I said before, we had five new hires in the past month. And of those new hires, 
they actually, um, I had to teach them how to do the nonprofits, <laughs> you know, yeah. the tax return. And um, I'm working with them on that. So they sort of get stuck in it, but we, we let them know up front that they're, they're coming in to audit and that they, they actually work on everything for the first six months mm -hmm. in, in their practice. And then we send out surveys after that every six months and you get to prioritize what you like to work on. Cool. So then after that, we do, I mean, there's sometimes you can't help your schedule, but we do try to make sure that they are, are doing the things that they like to do. Sure. That's great. <clears throat> well, Sarah, maybe you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you're doing now and how you got there. Sure. So hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I was a little late. I have three little ones here at home. And so making sure that I was barricaded in my room so they wouldn't come in um, while I was doing this. Um, so yeah, so I went to Appalachian State. Um, I was there from 2003 through 2007 for undergrad and then stayed and did my master's um, in 2008 and got my master's, um, which I love that program that Appalachian has where you can just do it all right together. It's really nice. Um, then sat for my CPA right out of master's and I actually um, joined PwC um, as an internship and then full-time after college. Um, and yeah, I definitely can understand the, the pull between tax and audit. Um, I am definitely an audit person all the way through and through. My husband does our taxes, I have to admit, um, <laughs> but I just get auditing better. Um, so, However, in, uh, in college, uh, I, I think it was either through one of the Meet the Firms or the Junior Experience Program, there was a video that was shown about um, an accountant that worked for a symphony. And I just remember thinking like, wow, that's really cool that you can use um, skills that you have for an organization that you feel passionate about or something that you feel, you know, like, you're interested in. Um, and so I think it was kind of at that moment that I realized like I love serving people and I would absolutely love to do nonprofit accounting at some point in my life. Um, I took a nonprofit course um, in college and loved it and was like, yep, this is the way I want to go. But you definitely feel that push um, to go to a public accounting right out of college. And, and I will say it was an incredible opportunity. Um, I ended up going to Charlotte. That's where I started with PwC. I ended up going into um, the financial services sector. So Bank of America was my client for three years. And that was quite the experience. A lot of long hours and um, things like that, but it was a lot of learning experience that I'm really grateful for. Um, and then I actually, because that pull was still in my heart to always do nonprofit, um, PwC had an opportunity to go to Washington DC and work in our government practice and advisory. And I thought, well, that's a little closer to nonprofit than Bank of America, so I'll take it. Um, the plan was just to go for two years and then come back to North Carolina and because and, I never wanted to really live outside of North Carolina. Um, however, um, about two years in when I was thinking about moving back, someone um, that I knew real well actually through PwC had an acquaintance that worked at a local DC accounting firm called Tate and Tryon and they did all nonprofit and trade association audits and tax and they were like I think this is really where you would fit really well because I did still love auditing but I definitely had that pull of like I still want to do nonprofit. So um, I ended up applying and getting going with Tate and Tryon and became a senior associate there um, and so still got to do audit, but for nonprofit and trade associations, which was more of like where I really felt like I could fit in and felt like I was doing audits for companies that I loved their mission. And it was actually through working at Tate and Tryon that I ended up having a little extra more free time because I wasn't working for a big four anymore to get more involved with my church community. And um, 
in DC and actually started serving with our college ministry at Georgetown. And through them, I learned about an organization called International Justice Mission, um, which is the organization I currently work for. Um, we are a large international um, a nonprofit that works to help in violence against those um, in the, 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 the people that are in the uh, in, impoverished areas. So we work with human trafficking issues, um, property grabbing issues in Uganda, police abuse of power, um, sex trafficking, online sex exploitation. So we are a huge organization that tries to eradicate um, violence against the poor. Um, so I just feel so blessed that um, through meeting the college students I worked with, I learned about IJM and then through them, I also learned that they were looking to hire some accountants and um, I ended up applying and got on and that was six and a half years ago. So um, I'm now their senior staff accountant and I work with a lot of different areas. I love my job because as an auditor, I get to um, lead our finance team in the annual audit process. And actually this year I started leading our 990 process um, to actually fill out our 990. I also work with fixed assets. So I manage that whole process and our lease accounting. So we have um, leases um, for our main HQ office in DC, but then all over, we have 19 field offices all over the world. So I manage all those lease accounting. Um, and then I just kind of get to help with different various projects um, that is needed. So I look at accounting research if we're kind of moving into a new area. Um, yeah, just kind of help the team keep chugging along to make sure we're compliant with different standards and making sure that we're doing everything correctly to um, have an unqualified audit every year. That's great. That's great. That's very inspiring. <laughs> Um, Fran, tell us a little bit about what you do in an average day or what you like best about your job or what you like worst. Just sort of give us a little feel for what it's like to work for a CPA firm that is serving nonprofits. Um, I don't really have an average day, but um, <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> at least this year since March 15th. Yeah. So started remotely uh, March 15th and uh, a few days before. But um, for us, we we deal with a lot of questions. We're a firm where we, we will do the audit and we'll do the tax work. And we, we try not to nickel and dime. We try to be there for our client throughout the year because we find that if they reach out to us when they're having issues um, and questions, then it, it makes it for an easier audit and tax return later on because they are not doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And so uh, I get a lot of client questions. Mm -hmm. We have both um, audit um, nonprofits and uh, they have the audit and the tax return. And then we also have um, the non-audit. So in Tennessee, um, for a public charity, you have to have less, if you have less than 500,000 in gross receipts, then you don't have to have a financial statement audit. So we have some, you know, smaller nonprofits that are 300, 400,000 that still need help doing their 990 and still need help figuring out sales tax and that kind of thing. Um, I think that's the biggest issue is, you know, with all of the Wayfair, uh, this, you know, changes this last year. Um, I think that the sales tax questions are my biggest yeah. opportunity for growth um, because I, I'm not a fan of sales tax law, but, um, and it's, it's vague. A lot of times um, the client will call and say, I have a quick question and it will be something that's way in depth and you have to research that. Um, so that's that's my day is, is looking into that and then also um, helping staff. Uh, we have new staff and um, the way it works is usually there is a team assigned to an audit and on that team is a member of the team that will do the 990. And the manager on that team is the one that usually does the first detail review. Well, if something happens and schedules, things happen, maybe I'll step in and do a detail review. But usually I'm the one Q, quality reviewing it. We say QR. So I'll quality review it and either um, one of the members here or I sign the returns. And so 
there's a process to go through. And also there's a question on the 990, um, on, like on page six of the full form 990 that says, you know, has your board looked at this 990, this full copy of the 990 before it's been filed? And so we have to go through this process that people don't have to do for 1120s and 1065s, any of the other returns is we have to send them a draft copy. If they've said yes, and they've detailed that they're gonna have that, you know, every all the board members look at the 990, they don't have to approve it, they just have to be provided a copy. Of it. Then we get it all the way through review and then we have to send the client a draft and then there's a communication back and forth. So I am in constant communication with my clients. And so um, usually that's that's where I'm stepping in is once it's to draft form and I've done some part of a, re, of a review of the return and then we'll step in and we'll send it to the client. And if there might be some questions still outstanding, I mean, um, a 990 again has a lot of compliance issues and we, we make sure that they, they really look at it. If there's anything that we have questioned and, in the review and we haven't, talk to them about yet, you know, I might bring it up and say, here's a draft, but look at page five, you know, uh, I'm not sure that this, this is right, but please let me know, you know, or we need some more information on your program service accomplishments. How many events did you have this year or something like that? Um, so that communication is amazing. We are, I'm in constant contact. You think of public accounting and you think, I'm, I'm in this room here by myself and I'm just working on the computer all the time, but I am in contact with clients all the time. I, I think sometimes students are a little dismayed to realize that because they choose accounting thinking, well, I'm kind of introverted and I'm good with numbers and I can spend long hours behind a computer and they don't realize that so much of the job in public accounting involves communicating over the phone, Zoom, in person, whatever. But yeah, you, you've got to talk a lot and you've got to be able to explain really complicated stuff to people. Sarah's nodding her head. She's experienced that. <laughs> yeah, very much. It's all true. You, you have to be much more of a people person than I think you initially think. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you know, it's, you it's build okay starting. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say it, you know, it's, it's a maturing process. And as the longer you work, the more confident you feel and the easier it is then with that interaction. Initially, you're not just shy. You're also very unsure of what you really know or don't. And you're afraid of saying something wrong and you kind of you grow out of that. And I'm sure Sarah had the same thing is, you know, when you first start out, you will have um, a senior or, you know, if, if you're in public accounting, someone over you that will help mentor you and, you know, just make sure you ask, you, hey, can, can I come along to this meeting or something like that? Different firms do different things, but we definitely will um, will pull along other staff in on meetings to make sure they understand how we communicate, even if they're just sitting there how they can see how we can communicate with the client. But yes, I've, I've been there and I hated the phone for a long time <laughs> and loved it when we moved to email, but still, I am in still const constant communication with clients. Well, I don't know about everyone uh, who's listening right now, how many of them have had a class in nonprofit accounting yet. Um, so, when you study principles of accounting and intermediate accounting, it's really focused on corporations that are organized to make a profit. And these audited financial statements are required by the SEC and analysts look at them and they analyze things like earnings per share and return on investment to decide whether this is a good company to invest in. Nonprofit is like a whole different world. There are no shareholders. They are not supposed to make a profit, they're supposed to fulfill a mission. And so then it's like, well, how do accountants measure and evaluate and report on how a nonprofit is fulfilling its mission? Because that doesn't seem to have to do with money necessarily. So maybe first Fran and then Sarah, give us some ideas of how accounting 
works for nonprofits to to provide the information that the nonprofit constituents are looking for? I think the big thing that they're looking for is whether the nonprofit is fulfilling its program service accomplishments and its mission. Mm -hmm. So on the first page of the Form 990, it shows it's a little tiny, small mission statement. And then again, on the second page, it's even a bigger mission statement that you can really go all out. And they actually, they only have so much lines on that form, but then they, you can roll over to the schedule O and just go on and on forever. <laughs> and, um, and then they have that whole page, and this is page two of the return. That whole page is talking about your program service accomplishments. And I've gone to different seminars and the IRS is really keen on this. They want to know, you know, what, what are the numbers? So how many programs did you have? How many people did you help? If your museum, how many people came to this show or this exhibit or something like that? If you are um, a performing arts center, how many performances did you put on? If you are a food bank, how many pounds of food or equivalents did you provide for the public? And what are the different programs that you do? And, and so all of those programs are there to fulfill the mission. And so that's so important in a nonprofit, whereas a for-profit, it's not as important. And also the other thing to, to know is a Form 990 is public. Mm -hmm. it, is put out there on the internet. You can go to GodStar, you can go to ProPublica. We can, you, there's several different you know, venues you can go and you can pull up a 990. And so it's public out there. You want to, I always tell my clients, let's look at that with your marketing hat on. <laughs> put your marketing hat on right. and, and really show, shine in those program service accomplishments. And when you do that, then, um, then it comes through. And then if, if there's people that are contributing, looking at contributing and they pull up the 990, it really shows what you're trying to do and what your, what your goals are and what your mission is. Okay. Yeah, that's really true. And I, um, for me, I, I kind of get to see also, so I put together our audited financial statements and help with our annual audit and, what I love about that is um, those are the financial statements that are going on our website where potential uh, donors or partners of IJM are going to read, you know, there's all the, not only do you have your financial information, but you have your footnotes in there that explain the work that you're doing. It explains what makes up those financial numbers. So just as much as uh, a corporation is looking for those financial statements to help investors, we somewhat have investors as well, because we really want people to get behind the mission because we are hundred percent public uh, funded. Another aspect of that is we do take a lot of government grants or just grants in general from foundations. And so they actually do look at a lot of those ratios, like the asset to liability ratio, like your liquidity ratio, your um, deck to equity, you know, how much do you have in debt? How much, you know, what does your net assets look like? Which is, you know, um, a big component of, of kind of another way of saying like what, how much money did you come in and how much did you spend? And then for government grants, they are looking at program to support ratio. So how much money did you come in? How much money came in versus how much did you actually spend on actual programs versus overhead or salaries, things like that. So there is a lot of different components to making sure that your financial reporting and your numbers that you're reporting is, is accurate is really important. Important because um, another aspect is, is if we made a mistake on the accounting team where it might you know prevent us from having a clean audit as we call it you know that really could hit our credibility as an organization so we might not get as much funding or you know people would be a little more skeptical to give us money if they're saying like well you're not going to use the money right if I you know give it to you so that's a huge part of making sure that we do our jobs really well and then one aspect for me that I see from like a uh, internal side of things is I'm starting to see like the our leadership uh, accounting uh, professionals like the controller and the CFO, they're becoming key parts of decision making um, for the nonprofit. So do we have enough 
revenue budgeted to come in to help fund this program, or they're constantly having to create internal reports to be able to show our global leaders that we're meeting certain objectives or like we're not doing, um, we're not spending more than what we should as far as budgeting. Do we have enough revenue coming in to get us through the end of the year? There's a lot of decision making that has to happen um, that it's now starting to include um, accounting professionals, which is something really exciting for me that I see that you know, I think sometimes you think of accountants kind of being behind the scenes and, and oftentimes our, our, our work is overlooked. We're not really the, I'm not the one doing the rescues out on the field. I'm the one that's doing the accounting. However, I know that um, my job is, is playing a big part in making sure that we actually can do rescues in the field and we can provide um, recovery for our survivors and work with governments to make sure that protection is gonna be happening for the people in their community. So it makes a big difference. Um, and, and there's a huge part of doing your job really well and making sure that we're reporting the right numbers just as much as it would be if it, that information was going to the stock market. It just looks a little different. Yeah, I, I... I'm pleased that you mentioned the stock market because again, in financial accounting, we feel like the value of accounting and of CPA audit and everything is to provide information so that the capital markets can function. People can buy stock having confidence that they have seen financial information or somebody has analyzed financial information about this company, that they're providing information, they're filing their tax returns, they're doing everything they're supposed to do. And, you know, of course, there are always exceptions um, and scandals and so forth, but we feel like the accounting function is what enables the capital markets to be efficient and for there to be a free flow of, of capital in the country. And I'm thinking from what the two of you have just said that this is similar for nonprofits. We're not talking about stockholders or investors or pension fund managers deciding whether to hang on to that Apple stock or to get rid of it, but we're talking about donors and some of them with millions or you know billions of dollars to fund and they're trying to decide what nonprofit do I want to invest in and they're looking at those financial statements and saying is this nonprofit taking those funds they're getting from donors and turning them into measurable output, meals served, rescues taking place. And so the accounting function, again, is enabling these nonprofits to fulfill their mission and to get the funding that they need to grow and to continue their work. So I know students talk to me about being an accounting major sometimes it's like oh, I don't know if I want to go into you know big four CPA or you know they they feel like it's all about materialism it's all about money it's all about profit and that's part of what's wrong with our society you know in, in some people's minds but accounting is also an extremely crucial um, skill that can really help in the nonprofit world to make the world a better place and to counteract all the negatives that materialism and greed um, create in this world. So I'm, I'm so happy that both of you um, are sharing your experience and helping us to see that. One of the things um, with this is that, you know, um, you said earlier, nonprofits aren't really focused on making a profit. They're not focused on making a profit, but yet if they don't make a profit, then they can't sustain themselves. Exactly. Nonprofits, that's something that people just, are, you're a nonprofit. First of all, you, you never pay tax and you, you don't have a profit. Wait a minute, you, but no, those are all myths, <laughs> right. those. And um, because the nonprofits, you know, a, a lot of them do pay tax. A lot of them have an, an unrelated, business income stream and that stream allows them to um to to have money for their mission and they have to pay tax on that unrelated business stream yeah i know there's a lot of irs rules and i'm not going to bore you about that because this isn't a tax class but you know there's it's a it's complex and if they don't know it they can get in trouble and they can lose their public uh you know their determination letter from the IRS saying they're a 501c3, their exemption, they can lose it. And then they're not providing that 
that public support. They're not providing that, that mission. And that's important. It's important to have all of your, all of your T's crossed and your I's dotted and accountants can do that and enable the rescues and the food, you know, provided. And, and I will, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think when I was an accounting student, there was kind of this um, stigma that the top of the class, like the smartest people, they went to those big four firms, they went to the highest, you know, places to go. And that, you know, can be true for some people. But what I'm realizing in nonprofit and what I'm trying to do in my career is, I want to be the best accountant that I possibly can so I can serve my mission really well. So, you know, thankfully I was able to get good grades in college and do really well and go with a big four. And I'm grateful for that experience. But um, we need more people in nonprofit sectors that are just as talented, just as knowledgeable, because they really get to be like the true leaders of tomorrow and make a difference and, and, and make sure that these organizations that are changing the world, like you said, you know, both Fran and Mary, that they, that they are able to carry out those missions. And so we need really smart, knowledgeable accountants that are savvy in so many different areas. And I think that's the one thing about nonprofit too is, you know, Fran kind of mentioned they've got the audit and tax side combined. What I love about nonprofit is it actually does combine so many things. Like I kind of wish I would have paid a little more attention to my actual like finance classes where I could understand all these um, ratios because it does make a huge difference if we're having to fill out a report for a donor or try to get a loan, um, you know, line of credit, whatever that might be. Um, we have a treasury department at our at our nonprofit. So I wish I was a little more savvy. And I also wish I was a little more savvy in the tax side of things too, because taking on the 990 this year was, was, was quite challenging to learn all the different tax rules and things like that. So that's what I love too, is that you do get, get a chance to kind of mesh all of these things together um, by getting to do non profit type of accounting and internal accounting. And another thing with this COVID that happened that was unusual this year is we had a call out and this was in April that, um, you know, we, we had a lot of clients that were struggling with what to do. Most nonprofits will do a budget once a year and they'll stick to that budget. But all of a sudden that budget was out the window. It was totally wrong because they were either not getting any revenue in or they were having to do, you know, one revenue stream would be, would be good, but the other not, you know, just depends on what it was. And so, um, you know, we had to step out and put on our budgeting and scenario planning, which people don't usually have to do. Uh, we had to put those hats on and and we had, you know, seminars with our clients on that. So it was totally different. We were trying to help our clients figure out what to do next. And so that was real interesting. And it, so there's a lot of different things that you can be doing. It's not just all ticking and tying and filling out the tax return. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, because nonprofits don't necessarily pay income tax unless they have those unrelated business activities, but they are still involved with sales tax issues, employment taxes, property taxes. I mean, there's no end to the different kinds of taxes. So tax is a much broader term than most people think of. And you both touched on, on something else. I, I have heard and not recently, so maybe this myth has already been put to rest, but I have heard people say, well, you know, if you end up with a C average or something, you might, you might not get into public accounting, but you could always like go work for a nonprofit. They don't expect as much, you know, you don't need the same level of expertise. It's not going to pay as well, but it's not as high pressure. And that there's just sort of this, this myth out there that it's like, well, if you don't want to work really hard or, or if you don't, you know, have a stellar GPA, maybe you should think about a nonprofit. And I, I'm not getting that impression from either one of you. <laughs> I'll definitely say that's not the case at the nonprofit I work for. We go through a very rigorous interview process and, um, you know, we really are looking for quality staff. And I would imagine that's probably the case at most nonprofit organizations because there is so much risk. You know, I mean, I've 
I myself have gone through a lot of, uh, been on a lot of interview teams for staff and I've, we've actually turned down more people than we've hired just because we are looking for that just ideal candidate that can, I think with nonprofit too, you, you, you need to pick up things pretty quickly because there isn't as much focus on nonprofit in, in colleges and, you know, kind of gearing people up. Most, most of that knowledge is, is kind of pushed towards, um, you know, for-profit co corporations. So you kind of need someone that can pick up knowledge very quickly and can prove that, you know, they had great grades in college because they could pick up material pretty easily or quickly and, and, and put in the extra effort to make sure they can get up to speed um, quickly. So I would say at least for our, from what I can speak for our organization, you know, it, it just is not just accounting, but it's across the board, we are looking for just the, the top-notch people that are willing to just serve. And, you know, unfortunately, it is just it is just true that nonprofit doesn't pay as much as you know public. I, I realize my salary would be quite different if I was in public accounting, um, but I will say for now I'm, I'm a mom of three, uh, three little ones, and if I'm going to keep working as a mother, for me, I want to wake up every morning and end every day knowing that my work was meant for something. Um, and so I know that I can tell my kids, like, yeah, mommy's on a meeting right now, but my, you know, you know, remember what mommy's organization does. You know, we help make sure that the bad guys, you know, don't don't hurt other people. And so, I know that that is. Um, it helps me to feel like the work that I'm doing is, is for something good and it gives me purpose to the work that I'm doing where, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to come across as like pushing you away from public accounting because there's so much good that can come from going with that, that big company right out of college and getting that experience. And I think actually, I don't know if I might be jumping ahead to one of the questions of like, would I recommend the same kind of route that I did? And I would, I actually would recommend getting good experience the, the internship opportunities that are at within public accounting and Fran you can probably speak to this better than I can but they are incredible and the training and the amount of knowledge that you gain going with those firms initially is is really invaluable like they really pour into the staff early on and that is one thing I will say for nonprofits um, that has been more of a struggle I'm grateful I had prior years of public accounting knowledge where I knew how to get continuing education or I knew the types of trainings because I'm not really getting it from my company. I'm getting it more from me seeking it out from organizations. Whereas when you go with public accounting, they're really pouring into you. Like you get 40 hours of CPE, no problem um, throughout the year. So uh, you know, that that is good. So there is a lot that can be said for the knowledge that you can gain um, within public accounting. Again, but there's just such a level of purpose that you have working with nonprofits that you I just didn't get to experience in public accounting or working for a corporation. Um, I just for me and, and my heart and wanting to serve other people, this is where I could play that out the best. Well, and also, you know, um, Sarah has a position and, and I talk to a lot of accountants, but there's there's a lot of other fields in the nonprofit arena that are more accounting based. And I know we don't have just from, we were talking at the very beginning, we don't have all just accounting majors. Um, there's, there's development. So if you're working for a large nonprofit, they are trying to go out and, and it's sort of a, a cross between marketing and accounting. So you need to be able to understand, you know, if you're getting a pledge or a grant, there's grant writing, there's there's a lot, a lot more that you can do with, uh, a, a, sort of a, a numbers degree, it doesn't have to be accounting or a business degree in the nonprofit world that, that is very interesting. And there's a lot of large nonprofits that, that have a huge accounting staff that will help them. Um, they, they have to, you know, again, there's all the taxes, the different taxes, and then if they've got UBI and to look at that and, and then just to figure out, okay, a lot of times the accountant is pulled in, hey, can I do this to make more money to be able to do this with the money? And, you know, it's a matter of, is there, you're, you're really thinking outside your box, you know, outside of what the norm is. Let's be creative. We have a, um, <clears throat> a large 
Center for Nonprofit Management here in Nashville, and we have the largest award ceremony. And part of the award ceremony for these nonprofits in the area is unique ways of reinventing their revenue stream. So yes, they're, they're wanting to, you know, maybe they are a food bank for school-aged children and they try to figure out how to collect the food from the farms and get them and cook them and provide them to the schools, you know, maybe a different way, something like that. And it's really interesting. It's, it's very rewarding to see that they come up with all kinds of things and you really have to, to have an imagination besides that accounting degree to, because once you think of something, you have to go, okay, can we make this work? Is this going to make enough money to provide this service? You know, is this going to, how, how many people are going to be affected? How is this going to help? our mission and, and create create a, a better world. And so it's it's very interesting. So there's there's lots of different different ways to to be an accountant within a nonprofit than just the CFO or controller. So um, Sarah clearly um, gets a lot of meaning from her work because she feels like she is directly um, Fran, maybe not quite as directly, but surely you can look around the, the community and the state and see things that, that your clients have been able to accomplish thanks to the advice and the guidance that they got from your CPA firm. Definitely. And every time I look at a 990 that you know I've, I've prepared and I'm ready, I think about all of the, the donors that are looking at that. And, and I've made sure that the client has put their best face on that return. And yet it's in compliance with everything with the IRS at the same time, but yet the, the additional information is out there. And when the client calls and says, help, I need this, I'm there to help them. And so we have a, a really good organism, you know, a group of, of nonprofits. We have over a hundred nonprofits that we serve um, and it's, it's amazing. I, I love it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't work for for profit <laughs> again. <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, um, it's 342. If either one of you has something else that you're really anxious to share, I'll give you the opportunity to do that. And then we'll open it up for questions. You ready to address questions? Sure. Okay. So students, unmute yourselves if you have um, if you have any questions. We have some questions in the chat box. So one of them is, what is the best way to seek out nonprofit accounting opportunities in our area? That's a great question and actually one I really struggled with um, kind of coming out of college. Um, honestly, I would just say, um, especially for those that still might have internship opportunities available, um, just seek out, you know, missions that are around you like a local food bank or, you know, I mean, um, any kind of, you know, nonprofit around you and just ask if they have any internship opportunities or, um, if, if, you know, one thing I did in college that I loved getting to do and while I was trying to really figure out which path I was going on was just reaching out to different people that I knew in different places. So just asking what advice they have, um, if, if they, if you could speak to someone in their accounting department about, you know, how they could get involved or things like that. There's, there might be opportunities even for volunteer work. I know for, um, IJM, we have an internship opportunity that's in our finance department. It's actually Org wide, we have a, a great internship opportunity. So there might be actually opportunities for internships um, uh, right now in college to work with nonprofits. And, you know, I would even just say, like, not even, well, unfortunately, we're in the middle of COVID, but non COVID world, um, you know, I really would encourage you to look outside of, you know, your area. Like, DC is filled with nonprofits and 
there's other areas that are just the mecca for nonprofits. New York City is one of those. Um, sounds like Fran's got some great opportunities in Nashville area. So, you know, be willing to, to look out. And I also would say, um, I believe they're called Captain Krause, but there's specific um, public accountants and even the one that Fran is working like, or there's public accounting firms that focus um, on nonprofit accounting. So you could even look at that, you know, as um, I know like RSM is our auditor. So there, um, I don't know how much of the big four go into nonprofit, but some of the more middle size and smaller nonprofits, they, uh, sorry, uh, smaller accounting firms, they focus on nonprofit accounting. And so that's a great way to get experience too. So um, our firm, we are actually affiliated with RSM. So um, um, our firm, is partners um, in this group that's called Rainmaker, um, and it's a non nonprofit CPAs, and you can go look at that up on a website, nonprofit CPAs. And um, we have a few things. There is, you know, just sort of like the, you know, CPA, but not anywhere close to that same amount, is um, a nonprofit, more of an accountant um, designation, and it's called the CNAP. And so that's also a test that nonprofit accountants can take and get another certification and it just it goes through it's a, I think it's a three day sort of the CPE and then there's a test at the end and it's just something else to go as a certification that you're a nonprofit accounting. Also you could look at your community foundation in whatever area you are so most areas will have some kind of a community foundation for for Nashville um, our community foundation gives a lot of grants to other nonprofits. So if you're just trying to figure out, okay, what is out there? Our, um, in Nashville, the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee has a website called Giving Matters. And so givingmatters.org, you can go on that and you can find financials, you can find, they, they will break them out. So if you're, you're interested in social services or you're interested in say for example, the sex trafficking, helping those that, that have gone through that. Um, I actually have a few clients that are, that are you know, specialized in that arena that are trying to you know, help the world with that. And so those, you, know, you, you can sort of look and see what you're interested in and narrow it down. It also, the website also has financial information and 990 information on it but your community foundation is giving grants to all of these organizations or a lot of these organizations. And so you can find out if they're gonna be a size that's gonna be good for you to seek um, any kind of employment or internships, or you could call your community foundation and find out if they know um, of you know, some kind of a, a group of, of information for public, you know, for these nonprofits that they may have some information about, oh, this one needs help in accounting and you could get an internship or not. So that might, that's another thing that might help. Um, those two things are, are, are big in, in looking, but definitely feel, understand what you're interested in. In COVID times, um, your social services are going to be big right now. Most of those nonprofits are having an awesome year because people are donating. Um, actually donations are up in those areas and they're providing services. They're, uh, they, they can't provide enough services. Anything like arts, museums, they're struggling. They're really struggling hard right now. So um, if you're interested in that, now's not the time. <laughs> you might could call them and see if there's anything you could do for free, but they're not gonna have internships. They've, they've laid a lot of people off. So if that gives you, hopefully that gives you some direction on, on what the best way to find out what these organizations are. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Surely somebody has a question. Marianne, this is Claudia. I've got a question. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. I, I very much enjoyed it. It's nice seeing you, Fran and Sarah. Very, very interesting. Uh, I applaud your discussion. A couple questions. Have you uh, had any experiences with some interesting uh, 
problems with embezzlement or any of your clients have some issues there with uh, perhaps things that they shouldn't have been doing involving the money? I have, I've had, um, this was, this came to us after, and this was a non-audit client, but it was, um, it was a sorority and someone had embezzled quite a bit of money. Um, and there just weren't any checks and balances in place at all. And this one person had uh, full reign and they were doing the, they were remodeling a sorority house and they were, you know, making up the invoices and things like that. And, and no one was checking. And it's very, very sad to see that because there were just no checks and balances in place at all on that. Um, Another aspect uh, this happened to one of our clients is the typical IT thing where, um, and this has happened a lot late in the last few years, is the CFO got an email from the executive director. It had her picture on it. It had everything. And it said, wire this to this. And um, she realized after she hit the button that she shouldn't have. And they were able to get most of the money back. But um, yeah, we've, we've had some, some fraud discussions and she learned her lesson the hard way. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, and I would say from our standpoint, um, just by you know, thankfully we haven't had much happen. We did have a, we've had a few incidents with our field office staff. Um, we've, you know, had a few field office finance staff make some wrong decisions. And thankfully there were a good checks and balances system in place where we kind of caught it early and ended up having to let them go. Um, but um, from that standpoint, other than we do end up having quite a bit of credit card, credit card fraud just by people taking our credit card numbers and we have to, we get suspicious activity on a lot of our credit cards just because of the amount of international travel that we do. The cards can sometimes get, um, the numbers get accessed or hacked off of different, you know, most of the places where we're doing transactions uh, in, in these countries don't have a lot of great security. So we sometimes will see a lot of suspicious activity on credit cards. But other than that, we've been very fortunate. Um, our job, our company actually does a great job of um, doing some security training, just like what Fran was talking about. I just took my security training to help me realize that there are um, emails out there where they could say like, hey, I need you to pay this payroll really quick or something like that. And it'll very, look very legit, uh, but it's very much a phishing activity. And can click on one link and then you've just made a huge mistake. So it's, it's, it's very much out there. We have an annual security training also now, and that's mm -hmm. been in the last two years. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then like weekly, the little email comes out with, here's a hint and here's a hint. And just to make sure you're doing the right thing. Any other student questions? Do either one of your nonprofits offer uh, internships? Yes, our, mine does. Um, International Justice Mission does. And um, looks a little different now that we are all working remotely. But I do know that um, I think we're still looking at internship classes potentially for next year. So I would just encourage you to go on the website and look. Um, and there'll be more information about what the recruiting process looks like for that. But yeah, it's a great, I love the internship at IJM. You get to meet with a lot of our global leaders. You can actually, there's opportunities to do internships in our field offices. So you could travel internationally um, as an opportunity. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And we also have internships, but it's public accounting. So it could be anything you'd be working on. So. <laughs> Uh, I think out of our five recent hires, two of them have been through internships. So that's, uh, we do hire a lot of our interns. 
And I, I will say real quick, as far as the students on the call, I, I don't know exactly what the program looks like now, but I know when I was there about 10 years ago, and, and from I work in student ministry, um, I, we actually live in Long Island now, but, um, and I work um, remotely, but um, Appalachian's accounting department does an incredible job of getting you guys prepared for the workforce. Um, I feel so blessed and fortunate that I got to go through this accounting program because I know a lot of students that come out of college without jobs. And I honestly just thought that was a given for almost everybody when I was in college that you got a job out of college. Um, and that is, that's really unfortunately not the case in certain aspects. So I think some colleges do it better than others, but just, you know, follow the instruction of your teachers, get involved in the extra things that they do, just like this call or, you know, the meet the firm's experience. Um, anything that you can do extra will really, um, those internship opportunities are, are huge in getting jobs out of college and um, both just with the education to getting you ready for the CPA exam. Um, I just, i just, I just feel so fortunate I got to go. And I think sometimes when you're in college, you cannot realize what's right in front of you. And I used to hear people say that all the time. I'm like, but I'm just tired of studying and this is really hard. Um, but I just wanted to say, just, just take advantage of all the stuff that's given to you now because it really can set you up so well. Um, I'm just so grateful for the years I had it app and with the accounting department that we had, it was just a really great um, opportunity and, and helped me get to where I am today. So just wanted to encourage you guys in that. Any other students with questions? Because I have a question, but I don't want to take time away from students. <laughs> um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that doubled the standard deduction, there was a lot of talk that this would just be devastating to nonprofits and their ability to raise funds because if people don't get a tax deduction, then they won't give to charity or they'll give less because they're not getting that tax savings. Is there any truth to that? No, actually of what we've seen in the time, and it may change, and granted, it may change, but the, um, the actually the level and contributions overall was up, but it was a different mix of contributions. There was a lot more of the big dollars and okay. any of the little, and then a lot of the little dollars, the medium dollars were gone, I guess I could say, but <clears throat> actually um, it was, it was bigger. So and then uh, there's also a talk about, you know, disasters, COVID, what, you know, how does that affect contributions? Now, of course, it will depend on, on each organization, but um, there's a lot of studies, for example, after 9-11, after major events, that the curve goes way up at first, people donate a lot at first, and then it goes under the normal and then it depends on the organization. If they're out there reaching out to their donor base, if they're reaching out to their grantors, that kind of thing, then sometimes it, it will go up and it will stay above the normal. So it, it'll be above the norm, the new normal will be higher. Um, so that's the studies after 9-11 and we will see after this. <laughs> when we get out of this. <laughs> It is kind of heartwarming to know that people will give to causes that they feel strongly about whether or not they're getting a tax deduction for it. That it's not, you know, it's not just a tax write-off. They really do care about these causes. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've seen it just in COVID. We actually took some budgetary measures where we reduced our spending significantly because we didn't know what revenue is going to look like. And We've actually been right on target with all of our revenue projections for this year. So it's just um, remarkable that uh, people are still giving and they, like Fran said, if I think if they can really get behind a mission, they're going to give no matter what. And, you know, it might look different each year, but they're going to try to give as much as they can. I think that's been the biggest change is, and especially I have noticed with um, your generation, all you guys, is is you're you're donating to the cause not just donating you're you're looking behind the cause and you're really interested in it 
and you're donating to the cause, whether it be time or money, um, and that's really good. And then the, the new, the CARES Act put in $300. So there is now that $300 deduction. So I don't know how that's gonna change things. If that, if that increased, if that helped any or not, I don't know. There'll be plenty of studies examining that. <laughs> yes, there will. <laughs> well, I think we are out of time. I so much appreciate Fran and Sarah, you uh, joining us and sharing from your experience. And I have learned a lot and hopefully the students have benefited and this has been recorded and it will be made available to students who weren't able uh, to zoom in because they were in class or at work or had something, some other obligation. So it will continue to, um, to benefit students. And um, yeah, just thanks so much. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad for if, if um, Dr. Hoffman wants to share my email, you know, if you okay. talk to her, that's, that's quite all right. I don't have a problem with that. If you have any specific questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them if I can. Okay. Same for me, no, Dr. Hoffman, I'll send you my work email. So that way, if anyone has any questions, um, I'm always happy to help um, in any way I can. Okay, great. And I'll make that available to anyone who wants it. All right, well, I guess this is goodbye. Best of luck, Thanks everybody. For Thanks for having us. Thanks Thank again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So.